Okay, um, we're going to talk about sunscreens, and we'll start out, first of all, the chemical structure of estrogen, and then the joke is, do you want to know what turns a woman on? A woman on? It's the phenol group in the estrogen molecule. So, first of all, for chemical structure, we'll take a look at cholesterol. Here is cholesterol, and the name is helpful. Choli means bile, because bile contains bile salts made out of cholesterol. Sterer S-T-E-R is for steroid. All the steroid hormones are based on this cholesterol structure. All is O-L, which means like an alcohol group, and cholesterol has a single alcohol group in there, and those end in O-L, their name. So you can tell cholesterol. It's the bile steroid with an alcohol group on it. The alcohol group is polar because of the different electronegativity pull onto the oxygen. The oxygen really wants electrons, much more so than does the carbon right here. In this carbon skeleton structure, I don't have to put the carbons in because it's just understood that they're there. So anyways, that's polar, the hydroxyl group, also called an alcohol group. And then the remainder of the molecule is hydrophobic, so it is nonpolar. And nonpolar means it's not going to be soluble in aqueous solutions. Almost entirely the human body is an aqueous solution. Um, so cholesterol can fit into plasma cell membranes because of the polar head group being like the phosphate polar aspect of a phospholipid. Okay, so a steroid hormone like estrogen, in particular estradiol is the main um, estrogen in women of reproductive age has a hydroxyl group in its corner and then a benzene ring right here. And so this combination of a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group is called a phenol group. And the hydroxy group is also called an alcohol group. It is antimicrobial. The aromatic ring, the benzene ring, is also called an aromatic ring because they tend to give off a nice smell, aroma. And the double bonds can move around from carbon to carbon. Sometimes that's called resonates. A purist might say resonate isn't the best word. But what this confers is extraordinarily long shelf life. So this is the perfect uh, preservative from a corporate point of view because you've got great shelf life so the product doesn't get returned. And it's antimicrobial so it prevents you know, mold from growing into the product as it's sold in a store. So it can sit on the shelf for years. And that's why uh, estrogenic type preservatives are in tons and tons of chemicals, including sunscreens routinely and, and most other cosmetic products. Okay, so we're talking about sunscreens, and there's two main types of sunscreen. So the first type is inorganic. Inorganic means without carbons. The inorganic sunscreens are also called physical because it, it implies a physical blocker of the sunlight. Um, and they're also called mineral because they're made out of minerals, so to speak. And so these are sun blockers, and there's only two of them. There's zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Um, they were originally thought to almost just reflect the sunlight, like a mirror or a shield. They actually do absorb some of it, but for our purposes, sun blocker, uh, these terms are, are good for our working purposes. There's less penetration into the skin of the zinc oxide or the titanium dioxide when there's not any nanoparticles. The, the reason why people were not completely thrilled, and the typical zinc oxide old-fashioned type is like the big white nose on a lifeguard from the thick uh, cream. Um, however, they now can make them with nanoparticle formulations where they make the particles very small and these cosmetically look better. A micro size actually means bigger than nanoparticle in case you come across those terms. Um, they're not estrogenic and they're barely at all absorbed into the body. So that's good. Okay, the next main category of sunscreens are what is called the organic because they contain carbons in them. They're also called the chemical sunscreens. They're also called ultraviolet absorbers. And it was thought before that they function like a sponge, like they catch the ultraviolet photon and then prevent it from injuring the body. Okay, um, and they've got a special chemical structure that very much relates to the estrogenic molecules. Quite often they are estrogenic. The problem is in, in biochemistry, like dissolves like. So your skin is mostly made out of lipid and keratin material and lipids are absorbed relatively rapidly transdermally. Theoretically, we evolved from sea creatures in the ocean and our skin's made to keep water out so you can swim in the ocean and you don't get all waterlogged, okay? You don't gain 20 pounds instantly when you jump in the water. But 
lipids put on your skin with a medication are rapidly absorbed transdermally. Um, these are some of the names of them. Whenever you hear the word Benz or B-E-N-Z or Phen, P-H-E-N-Y, that usually means that you're dealing with an estrogenic chemical with a benzene ring on it or phenol group on it. And so these are some of the real common ones. The most important one for our purposes to talk about is going to be oxybenzone, but just all of these things, you can think of them as being estrogenic. And whenever you see that, you can think of it as being probably estrogenic. Um, So 4-MBC and benzophenone are estrogenic in particular. They bind to the estrogen receptor. Um, in ultraviolet light, you know, according to the book Estrogen Generation by Anthony Jay, Anthony Jay is a really good uh, PhD biochemist who wrote a great book on estrogen chemicals called Estrogen Generation. And he talked about the ultraviolet light can actually cause these uh, sunscreen ultraviolet uh, filters to bind more strongly uh, to the estrogen receptor and cause a prolonged activation of it. This is a big deal because potentially this can imply a prolonged estrogenic effect in tissues. Estrogen in particular causes proliferation of the breast uh, cells and also of the uterus cells and in men of the prostate. The male prostate is very much like the female breast in terms of its hormone sensitivity to estrogen. Um, and so there is a, a reference to that, a paper about that. Okay, the types of ultraviolet light. In a simplistic way, UVB, B for UVB, B for burns you, sunburn, causes a sunburn. UVA for UVA for ages you, more skin penetration, more likely to promote wrinkles over time. Okay, oxybenzone is sort of like a prototype estrogenic sunscreen. And it's thought the mechanism of these uh, chemical sunscreens is that they absorb a photon and then an electron from the lowest occupied molecular orbital um, is then excited to the higher uh, or uh, the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular uh, orbital level and then it's dissipated as heat. Now that's obviously oversimplistic but it's good enough for our purposes. Oxybenzone is in tons of sunscreens. It's also called benzophenone 3. Those are synonyms. Um, it's not well removed by wastewater treatment facilities such that it could be in uh, someone's drinking water. It's transdermally absorbed, as we spoke about, as are most of these estrogens. And it's even absorbed. There was a JAMA paper, Journal of the American Medical Association, that not just oxybenzone, but several other sunscreen chemicals were absorbed in relatively surprisingly high amounts, especially oxybenzone. 97% of people in one study, they all tested positive for oxybenzone in their urine. Um, it is estrogenic and it has what is thought to be anti-androgenic uh, effects. It's lipophilic like other estrogens, so that can be absorbed transdermally and it can accumulate in one's fat tissue. So the point being is if somebody's repeatedly applying this or to their skin or in contact with this chemical, it can accumulate over time into higher amounts. It has been found in human breast milk. It obviously is found in human urine. And it's been shown to reduce the activity of the calcium ATPase enzyme. Uh, we'll talk more about all that in just a moment. There's some references here below. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about the sunblocker titanium dioxide nanoparticles. Now, I recommend don't ever put in nanoparticles on yourself. They're not well enough understood yet to know whether or not they're safe. Nanoparticle means super small, like 10 to the 9th, 10 to the negative 9th meters, all right? And that can be transdermally absorbed. And the fear is, well, if it can cross your skin barrier, is it potentially going to cross other barriers in your body, potentially going to uh, cross your blood-brain barrier, your blood testicle barrier? The capillary endothelial cells are connected tightly to each other in the brain. They're called tight junctions. And that's to prevent things that don't belong from getting into the brain tissue. And so the fear is that nanoparticles, some of them might be able to enter the brain and have a toxic effect. In fact, titanium dioxide nanoparticles are thought to be neurotoxic. And it's thought that they impair function of the circa ATPA. So circa means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, 
calcium ATPase. And what that is all about is calcium is like an on-off light switch in a cell, in a neuron as well. And the cell has to very precisely regulate the amount of calcium in its cytoplasm. If the cytoplasm calcium gets too high, the cell becomes overactive. And that can cause abnormal function like anxiety in the brain cells and the brain neurons if they're overly active when they shouldn't be. And even more worrisome too, when it becomes a prolonged chronic thing, and if there's decreased oxygen supply to that neuron, decreased glucose supply to that neuron, that brain neuron can be overstimulated and it can fail. It can die of what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death due to overstimulation. The name for programmed cell death due to overstimulation in a neuron is called excitotoxicity. So the, in brain cells, extra calcium is stored in the endoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasm is a term that applies especially to muscle cells, so they'll store extra calcium in the sarcoplasm. But in a neuron, after, let's say, the neuron's fired an action potential, it wants to, so to speak, turn itself off. Then it will pump calcium outside of the cell through into the extracellular matrix, and especially through the NACA exchanger, the sodium-calcium uh, exchanger. That's one way it, it gets that calcium out of the cytoplasm. Another way is it'll pump calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's where this enzyme comes into play, circa, sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. So titanium dioxide nanoparticles have been shown to inhibit the function of circa. Not good. You don't want anything in inhibiting circa. It also inhibits the circa enzyme in the testicles, which makes me think that it's somehow getting across the blood-brain barrier and the blood testicle barrier. Okay, so it, it impairs uh, spermatogenesis function and sperm function, so that means that it can cause infertility. So one has to be careful about just randomly applying chemicals to themselves. It's a dangerous thing to do. Um, some other references here about it causing inflammation in the heart, cardiac inflammation in mice. Uh, this book, Calcium Connection by Brundy Brody, is a very good book. Um, it, it talks a lot about inhibitors of the circa enzyme in multiple different contexts. Okay, zinc oxide nanoparticles. Uh, now this is for zinc oxide has also been made into nanoparticles. And the reason companies do this is typically, you know, we talked about the lifeguards, big bulky cream on the white nose. That's cosmetically less appealing. So people want sunscreens that are more transparent. Well, these effects can be achieved or almost achieved by using nanoparticles for the zinc oxide. But the problem is the zinc oxide, if it you know, gets, gets into the eyes, the nanoparticles get absorbed and they affect the eyes. They can be harmful to the eyes is what it's thought based on research in vitro. So here's one reference, zinc oxide nanoparticles inhibit calcium ATPase in human lens epithelial cells. All right, so not good. Um, And the, relevant of all the, the relevance of all this information is it's going to help you be able to intelligently choose what sunscreen to use for yourself or for your kids. Okay, so there was a big article in the Journal of the American Medical Association on sunscreens. So, so here it is. Uh, the title of the article, Maximal Use Conditions on Plasma Concentrations of Sunscreen Active Ingredients. Okay, that's from JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, 2019. So the point of this was surprisingly large amounts of these estrogenic chemicals were absorbed transdermally after a single application of sunscreen. And these four chemicals in particular, avobenzone with the bens in there, oxybenzone, octocrylene, and ecamsule, were all absorbed in amounts greater than 5 nanograms per milliliter on the first day when they measured it post-application. Post and oxybenzone in particular had very high levels of transdermal absorption. Um, so the question then becomes, well, is this safe? And it's not exactly known what effect it's going to have. Oxybenzone is known to be estrogenic and have some estrogenic effects. Um, and these estrogens, they can get into the breast milk. If a woman is nursing, I would strongly recommend she doesn't, you know, uh, put this on her skin. That would be my thoughts, you know. Can I prove that it's a bad idea? No, but I can certainly say common sense would suggest it's not a good idea to have exogenous estrogens uh, going into one's breast milk. You know, and the baby might cause uh, premature uh, pubertal features. You know, not good for the baby. Um,
Okay, now we're going to talk about what do I actually do? What do I actually think is the best thing to do? I don't wear any sunscreen. You know, I don't need to go to the beach and rub stuff on myself and sit around all day. All right, I know a lot of people like doing that. I know people sometimes go on vacation to a sunny place. So me personally, to get my vitamin D, I'll go out in the sun, read a book for about an hour, you know, put my front to the sun, my back to the sun. I'm fine, you know. My wife yells at me if I'm in front of the house, you're lowering the property value. You know, that's all I need to do. My vitamin D is all is good. I feel good. So that's all that's necessary. But I realize some people really want to go out in the sun and spend a lot of time out there. Maybe they have to for their job or for a social reason. So what should you do if you have to be out in the sun for prolonged amounts of time? I would recommend getting a mineral sunscreen uh, with inorganic zinc oxide and with no nanoparticles. So I would use the thick, you know, creamy, messy one um, and definitely make sure there's no nanoparticles because I think, you know, there could be potentially significant toxicity if there is nanoparticles. So put effort into confirming that. And I think that would be safest for kids based on my uh, reading on the subject. I would definitely not get any type of chemical sunscreen with all these estrogenic chemicals. I think they're under-recognized. You know, people run around with a pink ribbon, oh, we're raising money for breast cancer. Well, you know what? They should raise education about estrogenic chemicals that cause breast cancer. And one of the things it comes down to is not rubbing chemicals on yourself. To me, it's obvious. I don't want any chemicals on myself. I don't like putting stuff on myself. Nothing. Versus I know women, like for example, my wife got a separate bathroom. She has 55 cosmetic products. I have zero in my bathroom. None. Um, so again, the rule of thumb for being healthy, I think it's live like Adam and Eve, but the benefit of modern indoor heating and plumbing, um, cause you're going to find in almost anything you could rub on yourself, there's going to be, um, estrogenic preservatives in it. And this includes deodorants, moisturizers, perfumes, colognes, shampoos, soaps, laundry detergents, uh, clothing softeners. It goes on and on, uh, things that prevent, uh, sun damage. They're all, almost always have these estrogenic chemicals in them. Um, I would avoid the sprays too. You can potentially inhale stuff and then it can get through your cranial nerve in your brain. You don't want that. I would avoid anything with parabenzoic, uh, paraben preservatives because they tend to be estrogenic. Um, and then here's just a couple of um, references for anybody who's curious to read more about it. But the bottom line is I think the chemical sunscreens uh, are potentially dangerous, and I would not put them on myself or my kids. If you just have to do it for, you know, two days or something when you're on a vacation, it's probably no big deal. But if you're putting it on oneself on a frequent basis, it's potentially causing an accumulation progressively of estrogenic chemicals in your body, plus who knows what other chemicals they put into them. So anyways, in summary, the uh, zinc oxide, uh, one with no nanoparticles would be the best one, but I actually think the best thing to do is just don't use sunscreen. Don't be outside so much. And um, so anyways, uh, that summarizes it.